Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I would first like to, uh, perhaps I should say good evening and welcome to everyone. Uh, I would first like to acknowledge the Ghana people, the original custodians of the Adelaide Plains and the land on which the University of Adelaide's campuses at North Terrace, Waite, Theberton and Roseworthy are built. I'd like to welcome you all to uh, tonight's free public talk, which is part of our highly successful Research Tuesday series. My name is uh, Robert Saint. I'm the Pro Vice Chancellor of, of, uh, for Research Strategy at the University of Adelaide. Uh, and uh, although I've only been here a relatively short time, I've heard wonderful things about the Research Tuesday events, and uh, I'm very much looking forward to this one myself. It's been a wonderfully rich and diverse year for the Research Tuesday presentations. So far, we've, had, uh, we've heard about topics such as chronic pain, uh, chronic pain management, market and business intelligence, the evolution of plant life, issues with housing and accommodation, and dietary fat. Tonight, and I have to say, this is a fabulous turnout. It's, it's wonderful to see so many people here uh, interested in tonight's topic. Tonight, our research... Tuesday deals with a very different topic and, quite literally, we hope it will give us a window into the ancient past. Tonight's topic is Shards of History, How Glass Changed the World. Our speaker is Dr Margaret O'Hay, who is a senior lecturer in our discipline of classics. Margaret is also director of the University of Adelaide's Museum of Classical Archaeology. And if you've never paid that mu museum a visit, tonight might inspire you to do so, and I do encourage you to do that. It's a fascinating collection. In addition to her teaching and research, Dr O'Hay is also a practicing archaeologist, a self-confessed dirt, and sometimes dirty, archaeologist. And if that weren't enough to keep her busy, she also teaches an archaeological field school in Jordan, which can be a very hands-on experience, and I just, I just volunteered my services to that because it sounds like an extraordinary experience. Dr. O'Hay has a lifelong interest in the transition of material culture from Roman times to Islam in the countries that we now uh, that we know today as Jordan and Syria. Would you please welcome Dr. Margaret O'Hay? Thank you very much for that introduction, and it is lovely to be here, and I, I would like to thank the university for inviting me to this wonderful series. I've been to quite a few myself over the uh, years that it's been run, and I've always found them to be fascinating. And I realise that tonight's talk um, has its interest not because of me, but because of the substance of what I'm talking about. It, it may seem a rather ambitious title, um, Shards of History, How Glass Changed the World, uh, and to a certain extent, that is uh, part of its, its sellability, that, that this is what glass or a study of glass can do. But there is uh, not a lot of exaggeration in the history of glass in the old world, in the region where it was first discovered. And I want to give you a taste today of some of the ways in which my research has been part and parcel of the modern exploration of ancient glass and how it's uh, changed and developed itself and changed and developed cultures uh, that use it. Just to give you a sense of some of the sites that I've worked on for the past 30 years, uh, these are some of the places in uh, Jordan that I've been uh, associated with as a glass specialist or uh, co-directing or uh, excavating. But most of, well, all of them, I've had to deal with the glass as well. And just to give you some sense of the range of material here and I've put some dates up just to give you a sense that most of these uh, are late antique or medieval. The ones that don't have dates are multi-period sites like Pella and Jerusalem that go all the way through from the Pella, the, the middle of the fifth millennium BC right up till the present day and Jerusalem of course uh, not, maybe not quite as old but certainly uh, as multi-period, very long-lived um, site. And I deal with the glass from all the periods on the site that I'm given the glass for. So I'm not a kind of Roman specialist or, I'm, or a, a, a medieval specialist. I have to deal with all that sort of material that's put in my way. Now, anyone who's an archaeologist is trained in some kind of material culture. They have a specialisation, whether it's pottery or glass, or coins or architecture. 
as well as being able to dig and do all the other things that archaeologists have to do in the field, record properly, survey, plan, all that sort of thing. But often I find that non-archaeologists think that if you're a specialist in a particular medium, like pottery or glass, that somehow all you do is just catalogue it, you process it, you record it, but you don't think about it. But in fact, I don't know of any archaeologists who are specialists in a particular material that don't write about the big picture as well, that aren't interested in the more uh, meaningful questions rather than just what is it, what was it used for, what date is it. Now they do take up an awful lot of time sometimes because you deal with tiny fragments of artefacts, usually rather than complete ones. But that's just the beginning of the, the process, the beginning of the exploration. The really interesting bit is trying to work out what it all means. And more recently, in the past 10 years or so, my own research interests have concentrated on that interaction between technology and culture. Um, and in particular, three periods of technological change for glass that have some impact in the cultures uh, where these changes took place. And I want to briefly go through some of them tonight. The first one is the appearance of uh, ordinary everyday glass vessels as opposed to ones used in religious rituals in temples, um, produced in moulds, and I'll explain why that's important in a moment, in the 8th century BC. Now that's the Iron Age for the Near East, and in particular a time when the Assyrians created an empire, took over a lot of other kingdoms, came down like the proverbial wolf on the fold to Israel and made them a subject kingdom, uh, Judea, Phoenicia, every, everywhere they could reach. Uh, and that's why I refer to it as the Assyrian Iron Age, because they, they were great uh, imperialists. And I'll explain why I, I got interested in that in a moment. But the second area, which is chronologically very different, uh, is the appearance of glass lighting, of ceiling lights in glass, and the use of windows. That is to say, architectural glass in late antiquity, that's the end of the Roman Empire, the early Middle Ages, as many of you know, um, from the 4th to 6th centuries AD and into the Middle Ages, and the impact that that had upon societies across uh, Europe and the Near East, the Mediterranean worlds. And lastly, uh, and this is an ongoing uh, project too, I've been looking at a transition of something that might seem at first glance terribly technical, a transition in the composition of glass from using mineral soda to plant ash in the early Islamic period. But that actually also links into a much wider and interesting issue about climate change and its impact on technology. Now those are the, the three things that I've been working on uh, fairly solidly the past uh, three or four years in particular. Uh, but as of this year, this January, uh, I've also um, finally got a chance to explore the physical nature of late antique glass workshops because I dug one up. And I'll come to that at the end of th this talk. Now just to remind you all of what glass is. Glass is made up mostly of silica and in the modern world that's sand. But it can also be made out of any silicate, so quartz pebbles, river pebbles, and they were certainly used where glass was first invented in the Tigris-Euphrates Basin, modern day Iraq, northern Syria, uh, because they didn't have a lot of sand there, surprising enough, if it's more uh, quartz pebbles. You can also use flint or chert uh, to make glass, and it's about 70-75% silica. And then you need a little lime to stop the glass if you heat it up enough, 17, 1800 degrees centigrade, you can make any silicate into glass. But if you pour water into it, it will dissolve again. So it's not a lot of use. So you have to add a little lime. And you have to add, uh, in, in the ancient world, you have to add a, a little bit of a soda to lower the melting temperature of the silica enough so that ancient kilns could actually melt the silica and make glass. To bring it down from that high, uh, temperature down to between 11 and 1200 degrees in order to make glass. So as I say, it's, it's about three quarters silica and then depending on the type of lime and the type of soda, the rest of it is basically that uh, with a little bit of colourance if you want to make it a, a pretty colour. And just to remind, uh, some of you I know are familiar faces and you've heard me talk about glass before, but just to remind you that this basic composition was in use from about the late 4th millennium BC onwards to make glass-like objects, faience, frit objects, 
usually molded amulets, beads, that sort of thing in Mesopotamia, which is where it was invented. Um, real glass, that's to say it's really glassy and translucent, glass-like vitreous, uh, in the interstitial bits in the lattice structure of glass all the way through since the end of the third millennium BC. Uh, and that's about the time of the royal dynasties of Ur, for example, in southern Mesopotamia. But you have to scroll forward till about the 16th century BC before you start getting glass containers, glass being used to make vessels. In particular, these sorts of vessels, which are mostly perfumed oil containers for religious rituals uh, and the odd very small chalice, uh, as you see here um, in Egypt. These are all Egyptian examples. And you'll notice also that in these early types of vessels, these date from the second half of the second millennium BC, that they are brightly coloured, fairly opaque looking, and they have uh, these kind of linear zigzag or linear um, trail decoration on them. And that's because in this period, the point of creating glass was to create a cheaper, more accessible, more malleable form of stone. Right? So they're imitating stone, including agates and striped stones. But they realised, of course, they could make them pretty stones, different colours from stones. And that's also reflected in what we know about the sources when we finally get writing in the uh, end of the third millennium BC. From that time onwards, the words used, and there were about three of them uh, in the Bronze Age to refer to glass, and they all are variants on the phrase molten stone or stone from the kiln. That's what they called glass. So that's how they thought of glasses, as a very expensive, very restricted item. Normal people did not see these. These are all from very wealthy, if not royal tombs, royal households, palaces, temples, but they were not for everyday use. So why does it matter to, to look at the history of of the development of glass and how it spread out from this very <coughs> restricted, high quality, high end royal use and religious use into everyday life. Well, that's because I believe that there is a very useful framework for looking at any kind of artefact, in particular glass, in terms of an interplay between demand, consumer demand for the product, and pre existing know how, which in turn then may precipitate technological change and that in turn changes the way in which people live, use the artefacts. This is, this is fairly universal. We think of, of most artefacts these days in the 20th and 21st century in this way, but it applies equally even to pre-industrial societies with, of course, certain caveats. When I talk about consumer demand in the Bronze Age, I'm not talking about a mass demand, but a demand at the royal level of society. But nevertheless, that interplay, that inter interaction, applies in a pre-industrial society. So how, for example, we get from those vessels that you just saw to something like this, which is not opaque, it is not strongly coloured, in fact it's been artificially decolourised, it is not made by winding trails around a core, as all the other ones were, but this was cast in a mould. All of these things are different ways of manufacturing a piece of glass. And this dates from the 8th century BC. So when I ask myself, how do you get from those earlier core wound vessels to something like this? This kind of model, this interplay between people, what they want out of the, the material, and the technology of the material come to play. And that, to me, is the most interesting aspect of it. It's not cataloguing the stuff. It's finding out how it fitted into everyday life or into the lives of the people that used it. Which brings me to that first research area that I've been looking at. Uh, it culminated in 2011 in a, a big publication on this particular topic of the 8th century BC, the Iron Age, the period of this uh, clear glass vessel, when we suddenly get a change from coloured vessels, opaque glass, to translucent, decolourised glass that's imitating now rock crystal, still stone, but a different type of stone, and for a different use, mostly for open vessels like this. And this is not a fruit bowl, this is a drinking cup. That's how people drank wine in these big open bowls. Uh, they're shallow, so they don't contain quite as much as you might think. But uh, this is the elite form of 
drinking, used in banquets but also in religious banquets in the Near East. And the big question for me was, was where did this idea come from, this change? And the reason why it, it began was that I was given a piece of glass to catalogue. I was, I was given a piece of glass to publish. I'll show you it in a moment. And rather than just describe it, draw it, publish it, I wanted to see how it fitted into this bigger picture. And the question basically came out as who pioneered or invented this idea of casting, making it a mould, decolorized, translucent drinking bowls? Now, when I started looking at this issue, it drew me to Assyria and to the Assyrian capital Nimrud in Iraq where these glass vessels came from, but not this one. This came from Gordian in Turkey, which was the royal capital of Phrygia. You may have heard of one of its kings. He was called Midas, a uh, later king. And Nimrod, of course, uh, the Assyrian capital. Famous excavation dug by the British in the 1950s to early 60s. Uh, Mr Agatha Christie, Max Mellowan, uh, was the director, and Agatha took the photographs uh, of Nimrod, the materials in the British Museum now. And Gordian in Turkey, which is an ongoing American excavation, again, very long lived since the late 60s, early 70s, and Janet Jones is doing the glass for that. So how does my research come into this picture? Well, the glass deep bowl that you just saw before this and the earlier translucent glass that you just saw on this slide came from Nimrod. And this, which is clearly the same idea, it's cast, it's decolorised, it's translucent, comes from Gordian. They all date from the 8th century BC. That's reasonably well dated because of destructions. And the Assyrians kept historical records, usually of them killing other people. Um, and then we get a record of people finally killing the Assyrians and destroying and burning down the palace at Nimrod. And when I say that, I'm talking about bodies thrown down wells. Um, the place was toast, right? It was literally trashed. Well dated uh, material. But what was interesting was that whenever anyone talked about the Nimrod glass, they assumed them to be Phoenician inventions, not Assyrian, and not despite the fact that the very first of these Phrygian um, decolorised vessels was found in the early 70s, they didn't assume them to be the source of this new technology because only two of these vessels have been found in Phrygia, uh, and after all, they're Phrygians. What do they have to do with glass? People trained in classics, people who've read their Homer, automatically in the 20th century assumed that if it was to do with glass and it was in the Iron Age or the Archaic period, it must be Phoenician because our Greek sources, whose contact with the Near East was through Phoenician traders, assumed that all the fancy goods that they received came from Phoenicia and that the Phoenicians invented glass, which they didn't, and that the Phoenicians developed the best glass of their day in the 8th centuries and 7th and 6th centuries BC and the Phoenicians produced all the wonderful textiles that the Greeks bought and the Phoenicians invented all the wonderful metal objects that Homer refers to, fantastic Phoenician silverware in uh, the Iliad for example, in the Odyssey for example. But the Phoenicians, whilst they did produce things, were also great merchants and what the Greeks didn't know too much about were all the other cultures in the Near East. So even today you will find in uh, exhibition catalogues, in any kind of catalogue about the Phoenicians or book about the Phoenicians, that they developed this type of glass. That the Assyrians couldn't have done it because all they did was go around burning down cities and killing people, enslaving them and bringing all the booty back to Assyria. And that is not an exaggeration because that's what the Assyrians said about themselves. So fair enough. But it doesn't mean that they didn't have a culture too, or technology, or abilities, or craftsmen. It just means that they also acquired everybody else's. Well, I was asked uh, in 2008 to publish a piece of glass from the Amman Citadel in Jordan, the capital of Jordan, as excavated by the Department of Antiquities and the École Biblique, the Franciscans you know, based in Jerusalem, in the 1980s. And what I was really given was half a metal bowl. Here you see it in Gloria's Technicolor full of glass insets and all of the glass which are the red, white, um, by white I mean actually decolorized translucent glass, colourless glass, red, um, translucent and blue glass were inlaid into a copper alloy or bronze bowl. We only had half of it, 
It was found in the debris of a destroyed citadel, that is to say the royal palace of the Ammonite king. Yes, you guessed who probably destroyed it, the Assyrians. We know that because they tell us they did. Um, so it, it too dates from the late 8th century, probably from uh, Shalmaneser in the 720s. So there it is. It came from a royal palace of the Ammonite king on the Amman citadel. It had been found excavated in the 1980s, but although they briefly mentioned it in publication, they hadn't quite realised how unique it was. Because it is unique. It's the only one of its kind ever found, ever identified. There it is uh, in modern colour, so the, the copper has gone green, of course. And interestingly, because of oxidisation, the red has gone green as well, you know, the glass. But the shape ex closely parallels the shape of the Nimrod glass bowls, of which many were found in the storerooms of Nimrod, and a few actually in uh, the, the storerooms in Fort Shalmaneser and also in the palace. And this is an example of one that's made out of glass from the storerooms of Nimrod, um, excavated by Max Mellowin, which had inlays. It was made out of glass and the glass was cut away, it's cast glass bowl, cut away and it has exactly the same sorts of inlays, little rosettes up here, glass inlays here and probably little rosettes there and these glass insets here. And all of these were cut down from hemispherical glass bowls. So my job was to try and work out where the heck this thing came from originally. It was, it was in a palace destroyed by the Assyrians, owned by the Ammonites. It has parallels in Nimrod, in the Assyrian capital. And again, uh, the common assumption would be that it was Phoenician because the Phoenicians were great with glass. But the more I looked at this, and I spent about two and a half years looking at every single parallel in every known medium, ivory, metal, glass, of which is comparatively little, ivory, metal, glass, stone. And the more I looked at the shape of this bowl, the more I looked at the details of it, and in particular the technology of it, that's to say the technique of setting glass on metal, the more I looked at the decoration of it, those little rosettes with the six petals, the clearer it became that the least likely candidate was Phoenicia. And in fact, the most likely candidate was one of the many formerly independent kingdoms of northern Syria that were taken over by Assyria. And if they were good little kings, the Assyrians allowed them to become governors of their own cities. And if they were bad little kings, they were flayed alive and their skins hung up on the battlements as an example to everybody else. Which northern Syrian kingdom it was, uh, none of us can yet say. But this, in fact, has kind of turned the whole concept of Phoenicia uh, and indeed of the ability of northern Syrian kingdoms to have a culture and a technology that's quite innovative, that's quite extraordinary for its day, casting vessels in glass, and these kinds of drinking vessels that were so highly prized that the Assyrians took them back to their palace. They were so highly prized that they were given as royal gifts to the king of the Ammonites and, and so on. This brings back the northern Syrian kingdoms, and I'm talking about the region of modern-day northern Syria, into southeastern Turkey, uh, Uratu, Ararat, that region. It brings them back into focus for the first time and restores some dignity to their cultural contributions to the Near East, whereas previously it had been hidden by this assumption that if it was innovative, it was Phoenician. And that is, in fact, one of the, the catchphrases of the Phoenicians, that they're innovative, that they're exploratory, that they were the, the sailors of the Mediterranean world. But in fact, the picture is a little more complicated than that. Certainly the Phoenicians uh, took up this technology at least uh, a century and a half later, but not in this time frame in the 8th century. Instead, uh, it's better to see the arrival of these objects in places like Nimrud and Ammon, modern-day Amman, as part and parcel of a world in which this kind of elite material was made in royal workshops for kings to either use themselves or to give as highly prized gifts to other people. And again, the Assyrian records tell us about this. They show it, they show lots of images of processions of people bringing high quality objects to, from one king to another. And the Assyrians themselves talk about this, whether it's ivory, ivory couches from the king of Damascus, king of Sham, 
or whether it's textiles from Phoenicia, these things are mentioned. Not, unfortunately for me, glass. So that was my first uh, big interest in this kind of change and how it fitted in to the picture. And the reason why that shift to casting glass drinking bowls is important, it has to do with something in between then and the Roman period. In the 8th century BC, this began. The Assyrians were wiped off, uh, as, a, as an empire, were wiped off the face of the earth uh, in the following century and replaced by Medes who were, within a few years, replaced by the Persians. But the Persians took up a lot of Assyrian technology and they continued to make those decolorized, you know, colourless drinking bowls. When the Greeks started to interact more with the Persians, they took the glass and highly prized it and talked about it. Aristophanes talks about it in his play The Persians, about their glass drinking bowls. Uh, and they don't imitate them, they just buy them or get them as gifts. And when Alexander the Great comes over and takes over the Persian Empire, his successors, the Hellenistic kingdoms, the Greek kingdoms of the Near East and of Egypt, take up that Persian idea of drinking cups. So each of the new Ptolemaic, Seleucid, Antigonid kingdoms that are the Greek successors to Alexander the Great started making those vessels. And you keep scrolling forward, so there's a continuity now, all based in the Near East. And when you go forward down to the Hellenistic period uh, with the greatest prosperity, the third and second centuries BC, where you get real mass consumerism and people start to mass produce pottery, mass produce figurines as souvenirs from the theatre, all this sort of thing. People want stuff. It's a very material world, the late third, second century BC. Some bright spark, again, in the Near East, decides to make those imitation, decolorized, cast, expensive bowls cheaply. And instead of casting them and then grinding them down and polishing them, they simply get a disc of glass, put it upside down over a half sphere of stone and let it sag. So they do the same thing, but much more cheaply. And these are called sagged bowls. And the minute that technology was developed in the, second, in the early second century BC, Every Hellenistic site, every 2nd century BC site in the Near East, no matter how humble, has glass drinking bowls in their households. And you may say, well, why is that important, other than the fact that they can now appreciate the colour of their wine while they're drinking it? Well, the importance is that now it's in their lives, just in one medium. But instead of being used for rituals, these little perfumed corfond vessels, they're everywhere. And so it comes to be that the last type of glass to become mass-produced were those little religious perfumed oil containers. And again, they think of a, a time lag of about five generations where glass is everywhere and it's relatively cheap. And finally, somebody somewhere in the Near East who's a glass producer, a glass worker, decides to mass-produce perfumed oil vessels, which are closed vessels. And they do that by thinking about a technology and developing it, glass blowing. It was not invented as an accident. Nobody blew a bubble of glass by chance. It was a strategy to make perfumed oil containers because they're the first ones that we have, these narrow perfumed oil containers. And the minute that was begun, then they realised they could blow big bubbles and make bowls and cups. And suddenly, in the first century BC, almost exactly the same time as the Romans arrived in the Near East, this cheap available form of glass making spread across the Mediterranean world. And as one Roman observed in the time of Augustus, you can now buy a cup of glass in Rome for a price of a few bronze coins, really, really cheaply. And so this Near Eastern invention ultimately relied on that earlier Iron Age development of the glass <coughs> translucent drinking cups as one of the, the steps on the way for this to come to be. And glass blowing allowed Roman consumers, and we are talking about a mass consumer market now used in a monetarised economy, to buy and use glass in whatever way they liked. They could use them, for example, for windows, for pre-existing Roman forms of architecture, which are bathhouses or steam baths, you know, the, the Turkish bath type uh, construction. They needed a type of climate control in those to let the light in but keep the steam inside. So we have fixed glass windows. 
Despite its appearance, it was this type of glass pane, which is from Herculaneum, probably was made by blowing and then cutting open the cylinder produced and folding out to make a window pane. It also allowed consumers access uh, to more glassware everywhere in all aspects of life, even down to the chamber pot we hear in a very disapproving Christian source. There are women using glass chamber pots, what, what luxury. But here as you see on an ad on a wall of a, a pub in Herculaneum, uh, the different prices of different qualities of wine, um, all depicted in glass vessels because you can see the wine inside them, that's how I know they're glass. And also as advertising in your local taverna, buy your carrot um, on a glass plate, your pickled onions in a glass cup, your perfumed oil containers, your painted fancy vessels, your cheap vessels. You could even trade them out of the Roman Empire across to India and China. Uh, raw glass to India where they started making bracelets in large amounts. These two vessels were found in uh, Afghanistan in a place which is, uh, has until recently been used as the US Air Force Base, Begram. This uh, is not an export. This is the change even to Roman provincials, uh, Celtic speakers in the western parts of the Roman Empire, in Gaul, parts of Spain and Britain, uh, had their own particular cultural traditions which they kept in the Roman period, including cremating the dead. But when Roman control came through and glass blowing came with it, they started to make cinerary urns specifically for their culture. So they used glass in a way that had not been used before in their own culture whilst keeping their own cultural practices. That second uh, research interest question that I mentioned at the outset uh, was to do with lighting uh, as well as windows. And this question, seemingly innocent, is a very complicated answer. When did ordinary homes in the Roman world start to use glass lighting and glass windows? The window question is slightly easier because the archaeological evidence is reasonably clear. No matter where you're talking about in the Roman world, windows remained used only for bathhouses or for bathing rooms in private houses right into late antiquity to the 4th century at the very earliest you might have some evidence of glass window panes in private houses but normally it's, it's after that. Now you may say what well, window panes have been around for 4 centuries. Why don't people realise that they should use them in their dining rooms, in their bedrooms? Why do they continue to use shutters and lattices and grills to keep out the birds and the burglars but why not use glass windows? Well again this is a question of culture and consumer needs and wants and also the experience of glass in their everyday life because it's only in the fourth century that people started to see glass being used outside of bathhouses and that clearly started to make people think yes I could use windows in that way too in my own house if I could afford it they're not that expensive we have the prices there are two different qualities of windows they're reasonably cheap uh, you don't need that many windows but why, why only um, probably in the 5th, 6th centuries? Because in the 4th century, a new form of architecture appeared on the Roman landscape, the Christian basilica, the Christian church. And their architects, because they were trying to protect a congregation that largely was based inside the building, rather than in the pagan world outside the building, and because there were now so many churches, they started to use fixed glass windows. And because these churches are springing up everywhere, this starts to disseminate an idea into everybody, everybody's minds, so that it's a possibility that it could be used in ways that had not previously been understood. And the same general idea seems to be behind the take-up of glass lighting as well, because our earliest evidence of them, and here you see some here, glass lights in a, gla in a bronze holder from the 6th century in Jordan, the earliest evidence from it for glass oil lamps dates from the 4th century AD. We've got literary evidence for this. In, there's an anecdote based in Antioch in the 330s, 340s about a, a widow of a shopkeeper complaining that the council ordinance requires her to put up glass lights or put up rather oil lights in the colonnade in front of the shop 
and the price of oil has skyrocketed because the council ordinance has required shopkeepers to put lights outside their shops. Um, so somebody's raised the price of olive oil and she can't afford to do it anymore. But we also have archaeological evidence. Um, I work also for the Americans at Petra uh, and there we've got a really well dated earthquake of 363 and a very big bathhouse which was using uh, hanging lights both before and after 363. Here you see uh, fragments of some of these. This will be published quite soon in the final report of the Petra Great Temple of Brown University. So we can see that these things are coming together. And we also hear in the fourth century of Christian authors writing about glass lamps as the amazing technological feature of the age. Forget the excitement about mobile phones when they first came in. People didn't write poems about mobile phones. Many people wrote poems about glass lamps or, or commented on them because they were so exciting, because it was so different. Previously, lamps were oil lamps, they were handheld. You could put it on a bench, you could put it on a stand. If you had very special occasions, you could make, put your pottery or bronze lamp on chains, but because they're solid and opaque, the light goes upwards. And as you probably know yourselves, in a dining room context, lighting the ceiling is not your primary concern. Whereas once you use glass for the same purpose, of course, everything is illuminated. And again, that appears to have taken place as a result of the building of churches and one of the two great festivals of the Christian church being Easter, which involves an all night vigil in the church. So you need good lighting as part of the story. The impact of all of this uh, was to change the forms of architecture, uh, particularly windows, changed the forms of Roman architecture into the Middle Ages, changed the ways in which people formatted their dining rooms when they started putting uh, glass lamps in the 4th, 5th centuries, and also changed people's religious experiences in all the major religions. Uh, not myself, but a chap called Sukhanik um, in the 1970s uh, did a great chronicle of the changing images of the menorah in Jewish synagogue art from the handheld oil lamp in the Roman period to these which are cup-like glass lamps uh, in the 5th and 6th centuries. So it runs almost parallel with that, that which you find in Christian churches. And then when we get to the 7th century and the Islamic period, they too do the same thing. This is a, um, an image from the wonderful, amazing world heritage facade mosaics from the great mosque in Damascus, which we hope is still well preserved, um, showing <coughs> hanging lights in all the windows. And indeed, we've got a famous Islamic commentator about the Dome of the Rock, which was uh, built in the uh, early 8th century, about being able to see the glass lamps shining forth from all the windows from the, the Temple Mount in Jerusalem as, as a call to prayer for the faithful. Uh, this light became an allegory in many religions, not just Christianity. I also briefly want to uh, mention this issue about the technological change in the manufacture of glass. See, there are different ways in which you can approach glass studies and get something interesting out of them. I've got a long-standing uh, collaboration with Professor Julian Henderson, who's Professor of Archaeological Material Science at Nottingham, is one of the biggest uh, departments of, the of its kind in the world. And thanks to a seed grant from the Faculty of Humanities uh, about 10 years ago, I started a collaboration with him looking at Islamic glass and its compositions in order to work out where certain types of is early Islamic glass was made. And most recently, uh, I've given him material from a site that I worked on up until the troubles began in Syria, in the East Syrian desert at Khazar al Shaki. Now that's about 90 k's east of Palmyra. I, I work on that site with the Swiss. I also used to work uh, at Jabal Khalid, um, and I hope to work there again, uh, up in the northern part of Syria, a Hellenistic site with a, an ANU University of Melbourne project uh, run by Graham Clark and Heather Jackson. But Khazar al Shaki, this Swiss Liechtenstein project, <coughs> it's an amazing site. There's the Khazar, this huge, <coughs> pardon me, hunting castle out in the desert. Sometimes you get sandstorms and I'm working there. I have to stop working when there's sandstorms because you can't see the colour of the glass. Um, and then within three or four days you can have uh, torrential downpours and the desert becomes a large sea 
and the director gets bogged for three hours in his Land Rover um, <laughs> trying to inspect the damage of the excavations. But this site is important and useful for many reasons. We don't, we're not dealing with this material, <laughs> wonderful though this site is, it's on a World Heritage listing. <coughs> this was dug in the 1960s by the Americans. The Swiss are, are digging all the support staff, high-ranking officials of the Caliph, um, outside those walls, but inside a much bigger circuit wall. And this was once irrigated pastures and meadows uh, and the uh, waterworks are being studied by Denis Genecon. Now, lovely glass in this site because it was built for a caliph called Hisham, but really precisely dated because it once had an inscription on the wall telling us when the whole thing was built. There was nothing there before 72930. And this is high quality glass, mosaic glass, hand scratched decorated glass. I might get fragments of it, but you can work out um, you know, what the full shape is like. And the pottery and the coins make it very clear that it was abandoned by about 8.30. So it's a really precisely dated uh, site. And in conjunction with work that I'm doing as a long-standing member of the Pella project, a University of Sydney project in Jordan, I can help make even more precise dates on the basis of the shapes and the decorations of this class. And this is important because when I give the samples to Julian, when I gave the samples to Julian, I could tell him very precisely what the dates of some of the material was. But as a, a, a good aspirational scientist, I didn't tell him any of that. I gave him blind samples so that he couldn't fix anything or, or make any assumptions until he'd done the graph. Now, Julian gives me back a graph. Um, it sounds unexciting, manganese uh, versus potassium oxides. But this is basically telling Julian, who then tells me, whether the glass was made using mineral soda, natrium, which is sourced in Egypt, or whether it was made out of burning plants, plant ash. And what is interesting is that in this circle here are two examples of exactly the same type of vessel, which I think um, on the basis of comparison with later pottery shapes, probably once contained date wine. Um, two of these from here, we've got many examples from Pella as well, that make it very precisely dated. This shape was in production from about 750 to about 800. And that means this is late 8th century. These are the earliest, by a long shot, the earliest datable examples of the shift from using mineral natron to plant ash as the soda component in glass. And you may say, well, it's academically very interesting, but what does that mean, Margaret? Well, what it means, sorry, what it means is that uh, natron was a mineral efflorescence in a place called the Wadi Natrun, which is in the western desert of Egypt. It, natron was used, or versions of natron, this mineral soda, was used in the Bronze Age for mummification. And then in the Iron Age, people started adding it to glass instead of burning plants. And the reason they did that was that you get a much more consistent amount of soda if you use this mineral soda. So you didn't have to worry about the weather, the climate, the soil for the plants. When you harvested them, you could be very consistent with your amount of soda and that reduced the chance that the glass would fail when you melted it. And so that in increased the reliability of making the glass. And you don't want the glass batch to fail because that's a lot of effort for, for no result. But then at some time in the early Middle Ages they moved back to plant ash. And Julian's theory um, was that this had something to do with necessity, not choice, because there's no advantage to going to plant ash. And the French who were working in the Wadi Natrun have done augers, they've done drilled bores into the Wadi Natrun and have worked out that the efflorescence seems to have stopped at some point in late antiquity, but they can't date it very precisely because they're just boring into the ground. Uh, there's no archaeological dating for that. What happens is that the climate changed because in order for this efflorescence of salts to form on the crust of the Wadi Natrun, you needed so many days of precipitation, of rain, in the middle of summer, and then you needed a bit more rain again. We know this because the Romans tell us this. This is, this is how natron was farmed. And when that changed in the early Middle Ages, they didn't have natron anymore. So dating that climate change is rather important because it helps understand what was going on in the Middle Ages. And it also helps us to understand that these things can have unexpected ramifications for technologies, ones that you might not have even thought of until the evidence comes before you. 
previously to this last year when Julian analysed this for me and we started talking about it, we thought this only happened in the 9th century. Now it's clear it happens in the 8th century because I've been able to give him, through the material that I work on, a whole variety of well-dated examples so that we can start to pinpoint this climate change and its ramifications for industri industrial production of glass in the Near East. A very important thing indeed. And I want to end with one last point. Uh, and this is the most recent ongoing research that I've been looking at. Uh, and it's about the assumptions that people in the past have made about the actual places where glass was blown, glass workshops. Not where the raw glass was made, because they were made in large furnaces in the Roman period, about the size of a small room. Then you demolished the furnace, because you could only use it once. And someone stood on it with a very big pick and broke it up into lots of little chunks. That is the technical term, by the way, chunks. That's how glass was transported as ballast in ships, and the French have found many of these in shipwrecks uh, off Marseille. Funnily enough, despite the fact that the Romans used so much glass, and they did occasionally talk about it, we've only got two representations of glass workshops in all of our Roman art. Um, one is on a tiny little lamp from Split, uh, which doesn't show you much detail. And then there's this, the so-called glass workers sarcophagus from Turkey, from Aphrodisias. And this is only about 10 centimetres high. It's in the bottom, uh, running along the bottom of a sarcophagus uh, of a man and his wife and his children. And we assume it's uh, an image of a glass kiln, a glass blower's kiln. And there's the glass blower there um, with his uh, blowpipe uh, gathering some glass. Now, the assumptions normally made about what a Roman glass house would look like, a glass workshop would look like, was based largely on medieval representations and medieval discussions about them. And they included the assumption that they were going to be uh, either beehive, and I showed you a beehive shaped manuscript uh, before, uh, occasionally rectangular because in France about seven uh, foundations of about seven Roman period glass workshops have been found and they look vaguely rectilinear. Also that they were made out of either fired brick or stone or a combination of them in order to deal with the heat for remelting the glass up to a bit above a thousand degrees. You remelt the raw glass in crucibles. And that they take several levels. Um, you'd have the fire down below in the firing chamber, a central chamber where you put the crucibles and where you put the blowpipe in. If you've ever seen glass blowers, you'll see that there's a central chamber and the furnace is underneath. And then there would be an annealing chamber, and that's important uh, simply because glass must not cool at room temperature. It has a very specific range, temperature range, that it must cool in over a certain period of time. Otherwise, it might crack. It might not even look as if it's going to crack, but if you cool it the wrong way around, the minute you put something hot in it, or you put it on a cold surface, or something hot on it, it will suddenly explode, which I believe is what happened to a few Chinese-made glass tables sold in Australia uh, a year or so ago, because they were not properly annealed. Right? So it is fairly important. Their technological restrictions got nothing to do with culture or antiquity on the construction. The, the siege, the melting chamber, has to be at, reach at least 1,000 degrees. The annealing chamber is between 500 and 570. Right? And uh, work on traditional glass blowers in the 1970s, the Corning Museum of Glass uh, did a detailed study of an Afghan glass workshop, show the same sorts of things. This is simplified, it doesn't have the annealing chamber on top, but that's where the blowpipe would go in, there's the furnace down below. That stone there is for rolling the, the blowpipe with the blown glass, so you get an even shape, and also for resting the blowpipe later on. That's not for his tea or coffee, that's uh, water to be poured onto that stone flat stone slab to keep it cool so that when you're blowing the glass then you can roll it a bit, take it up, reinflate it, roll it a bit, you can control the temperature so that, that has to stay a certain temperature as well. Now for 30 years now I've been working at Pella since I was a very small child, no, um, <laughs> since I was a, an honours student. Uh, first of all under Tony Nicol and Basil Hennessy who alas the great late John Basil Hennessy died last week. Uh, but uh, he was a pioneer of Near Eastern archaeology uh, and Cypriot archaeology and he's sorely missed. Uh, and nowadays, uh, uh, Stephen Burke of the University of Sydney is the current director. So there's a site in the North Jordan Valley and the circle indicates the trenches that are currently being excavated there. 
Now the main purpose of the excavations nowadays is to dig up the, the largest Bronze Age temple ever found in Jordan. Um, but above that is late stuff, as Stephen likes to call it, post-interesting stuff, uh, my stuff, late antique material. And in January, February this year, uh, I finally got the chance to dig a trench, five by ten metres, to uncover the second half of a room that I dug in 2011, which was the previous season down here, uh, which was a six, late 6th sixth or early 7th century glass workshop, multi-phased, multi-period workshop. It was incorporated into a much earlier building that was destroyed in the 5th century. There's a doorway of the earlier building there, there's a doorway. Um, but then it was subdivided into these workrooms. Now, workshops, glass workshops are very difficult to find. They come to you, not you to them, because how do you find a glass workshop? It's very difficult to find. They're very difficult to identify, which is why they're difficult to find. Um, you can find debris from glass working, but you seldom get the chance to find a workshop in situ or any of the kilns in situ, because they're very seldom well preserved. But in this particular case, the whole building fell down in an earthquake in the 660s. Yay. Uh, fortunately, nobody was harmed. At least there are no dead bodies so far um, in the building. But uh, I had to dig through about two and a half metres of collapse uh, to get down to it. But there it was. Even so, it's still not preserved at full height. But the best preserved uh, publishable material that we've got in the entire Near East. Because there aren't that many around. There's one at Beshan, which is 12 kilometres to the west across the border of the Jordan River in Israel, which has never been fully published or described, and the two publications that talk about it say contradictory things, so I'm not going to go into that now. Um, and the other two sites that have claimed to have remnants of kilns, Jelani and Sepphoris in the Galilee, um, don't actually have any kilns. They just have the traces where the kilns once were. Whereas we've got not just evidence of glass making because we've got the raw chunks, I told you we had chunks, these are chunks, just some of them, um, that were sitting outside the door in a pile waiting to be heated up. We've got the test uh, driplets, which is uh, when people test that the glass is hot enough in the crucible to be blown. And we have wasters. Uh, my favourite, this is a blown spoon that was clearly a bit wonky. Uh, and so they didn't sell it, they put it in the pile to be recycled along with these things, which are rims of cups that are, went wonky, so they put them in the pile to recycle them. It had multiple phases, uh, this glass kiln, uh, including a bench which had this year um, a complete waster sitting upright. They couldn't sell it because it was, yes, wonky, as you can see, but they could certainly use it. Uh, and so it was sitting upright in this bench, in this multi-phased uh, kiln site. I'll very quickly give you a sense of this. Um, different phases in this photo together. Once that bench was removed, we took it away. It was contemporary with this kiln here. An earlier kiln was found underneath. And in summary, um, these, at first glance, looked to be bread ovens when we came down on the top of them because they were built out of clay, made out of clay, that was modelled and put in place on site and it was fired by putting a fire inside the firing chamber. Right? So they were fired in situ, they were made out of raw clay. And that's the way that people traditionally in the Near East, from the Neolithic period to the present day, make traditional bread ovens. They're called taboons or tenours. So when we came down on the top of these, Steve Burke would come to the top of the trench and say, well, Maggie, what have you found? It looks like a taboon to me. And I said, yes, I know, I know. And then we came down and we came to the base and it had tiles in it. Now, no taboon has tiles in it. And no taboon has a, a channel around it, far less a stone-covered channel. There was a channel there, there's a channel there. Um, nor do they have these big stones. You may recall one in, in Afghanistan I showed you a photo of earlier. And they don't have holes in the sides of them either for um, a bellows, which uh, both of these have, a bellows hole to, to pump um, air into the chamber. The big one has, was full of this clay and stone rubble, uh, probably from a central pillar of, made of this clay or pise, uh, which supported chambers at, uh, of a second floor in it, at least one extra floor. Just to show you the earlier one, um, you can see this stoke hole or, or bellows hole here. The big one, this one, when you half section that, we, we found these tiles, or rather I found these tiles, which actually have um, tongues and grooves so that they fitted into each other for the second level, and no taboon has that. So this is clearly a glass workshop. And the exciting and interesting thing about that, and when I say central pillar, 
when it's cleared down onto the tiles, you can see that the ash and the burning is there, and this is not burned. So that's clearly when the, where the support went. Um, that's fairly logical. So there's the uh, bellows hole in this one. Now, our medieval sources, Islamic sources, talk about, I'm sorry for the bad graphics, but it was the best I could do at short notice, that you have this beehive-shaped uh, um, beehive shaped kiln, three levels, but <coughs> six compartments. So the central one would have these internal divisions. And in the medieval descriptions, which is what most people have used in the past, they've assumed that the fire's in the centre, right? Well, clearly, my kiln doesn't work like that because there's a central pillar. So it doesn't have the six um, divided like that. It must have been something a bit more like that, I think, which is unprecedented because no source, medieval or Roman, talks about it like that. But it's clearly there. So the significance of the pellet discovery um, is both this structure but also the use of this taboon technology rather than fired bricks and stones. And that's because people have previously assumed that you couldn't have a thousand degrees in something like a taboon. When I showed this material to uh, the two experts in archaeological science, Ian Freestone at UCL and Julian, who's dug his own kilns, medieval kilns, many a time, they both of them raised their eyebrows. And then I showed them all the material and their eyebrows fell. And they said, well, yes, they must be kilns. They are glass kilns. So this is unprecedented. This is brand new territory, um, exciting, but not previously recognised. There are some parallels for not using fired bricks or stones in contemporary Lombardic Italy, uh, where kilns were used for mixing colours rather than blowing glass. And we've also got a medieval um, source who talks about taboons for that. But they still need a 1,000 degrees centigrade. And the other important thing to note, this is not some sort of strange, wacky variant. This is from the centre of the glass-making world, the Near East. So this is the norm. And all the things that we've been assuming about Roman glass workshops is actually based on the variants in Western Europe and the variations of the Middle Ages. This is probably more like the default setting for these. I've still got to find the shop front, the actual work, you know, the sales room. Um, but that's next season in 2015 in the North Fork. I swear it's there. Um, and the next part of the process is to have the glass analysed. It's going to be a big project. Uh, and compared with the domestic glass already found in contemporary houses in Pella. But it's clearly evidence of, yet more evidence, of a thriving demand for glass goods. That this is in downtown Pella, in the heart of the city, in a period which has normally been assumed to be a period of decline. But is a period of great consumerism. I finally want to thank the people that helped me dig this trench, um, Mohammed Najjar and his team, in both, uh, both um, seasons. We started at the top, which is the book that I'm standing on taking, well, people are standing on taking these photos, and worked our way down to the Bronze Age in two seasons in this trench, um, stopping to record these, of course, perfectly en route, and working our way through um, the earlier mosaic floor at the end. But we got there in the end, as we have tonight as well. And I hope you'll understand now why I get so excited about these shiny little pieces of glass, these shards of glass, because there are an awful lot of ways in which we can still find out about the ancient world by looking at glass and its technology and how it interacted with its contemporary societies. Thank you very much for your patience tonight. Thank you very much, Dr. O'Hay. That was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, not only did you excite us with the, the, the story that, that you had to tell us, but also it gave us a sense, I think, of what discovery is all about, what research is all about, and how we've got so much left to learn mm -hmm. and how exciting that is. Uh, uh, I, I'm, um, I'd like to thank you for your talk, and I'll ask you all to join me in a second, but we have a small gift. It's pretty appealing to me. To thank you for your oh, uh, um, you. your contribution. Thank Would you. you join me in thanking? Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. I promise you, I won't be analysing the glass. <laughs> uh, the contents, well, that's another story. Yes. Um, now, before we finish tonight, I need to mention our last Research Tuesday's event for the year. Uh, it's a special forum on how will we source our energy. It's a topic, obviously, that's relevant to all of us today and, and for our future generations. That event will be held on Tuesday the 10th of December, so please keep an eye out 
uh, a look out for the details and I hope to see you all there. Um, now we've, we've run right up to the, to the closing time so I won't be taking questions but I suspect that uh, Dr O'Hare would be happy to talk to anyone who wants to come and ask her any questions. So thank you very much for coming and uh, we'll see you again at a future lecture. Thank you. Thank you.